Welcome to the True Crime Never Sleeps Podcast. I'm your host, Larry Lewis. Today we continue with a new episode, diving into the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. But first, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Poddex, for sponsoring this episode. You can check them out today at poddex.com. Use promo code Larry21 for 10% off your purchase. And now let's dive right into the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. Kennedy was 22 years old in 1948 when he visited the British Mandate of Palestine and wrote dispatches for the Boston Post about the trip and its effect on him. During this stay, he wrote that he grew to admire the Jewish inhabitants of the area and became a strong supporter and advocate for Israel when he became a senator. Appointed U.S. Attorney General in December 1960 by his brother, President Kennedy, he served in that post from January 1961 until he resigned on September 3, 1964, in order to run for election to the U.S. Senate. Opposing incumbent Republican Kenneth Keating, his first, his first attempt at elected office scored a tight race win in an otherwise landslide, or an otherwise landslide Democratic Party year. He took office as Senator from New York on January 3, 1965. The run-up to the 1968 presidential election under President Johnson was a period of great social unrest. There were riots in major cities, and Johnson's attempts to introduce anti-poverty and anti-discrimination legislation, and there was significant opposition to the ongoing Vietnam War. The assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. on April 4, 1968, which we're actually covering next week on this podcast, led to further riots in several cities. Kennedy entered the race for the Democratic Party's nomination for president on March 16th, four days after S- Senator Eugene McCarthy received a large percentage of the votes in the New Hampshire primary against the incumbent president. Two weeks later, Johnson announced that he was no longer seeking re-election, and Vice President Hubert Humphrey announced that he would seek the presidency a month later. Humphrey did not participate in any primaries, but he did obtain the support of many Democratic Party delegates. Following the California primary, Kennedy was in second place with 393 delegates, compared to Humphrey's 561 and McCarthy's 258. The 1968 California presidential primary elections were held on Tuesday, June 4th. Statewide results gave Kennedy 46%, McCarthy 42%. Four hours after the polls closed in California, Kennedy claimed victory. He spoke by phone with South Dakota Senator George McGovern. At approximately 12.10 a.m. on June 5th, he addressed his campaign supporters in the Ambassador Hotel's Embassy Room Ballroom in the mid Wilshire District of Los Angeles. At the time, the government provided Secret Service protection for an incumbent president but not for presidential candidates. Kennedy's only security was provided by former FBI agent William Berry and two unofficial bodyguards. Olympic decathlon gold medalist Raffer Johnson and former football player Rosie Greer. Kennedy had welcomed contact with the public during the campaign. People have of- had often tried to touch him in their excitement. Kennedy planned to walk through the ballroom when he had finished speaking. He ended the speech by stating, Quote, my thanks to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago, and let's win there. He was on his way to another gathering with supporter at, supporters elsewhere in the hotel. Reporters wanted a press conference, and campaign aide Fred Dutton decided that Kennedy would forego the second gathering and instead go through the hotel's kitchen and pantry area behind the ballroom to the press area. Kennedy finished speaking and started to exit when William Berry stopped him and said, No, it's been changed. We're going this way. Barry and Dutton began clearing away for Kennedy to go left through swinging doors to the kitchen corridor. But Kennedy was hemmed in by the crowd and followed Mater D. Carl Euchre through a back exit. Euchre led Kennedy through the kitchen area, holding his right wrist, but frequently releasing it as Kennedy shook hands with people whom he encountered. Euchre and Kennedy started down a passageway narrowed by an ice machine against the right wall and a steam table to the left. Kennedy turned to his left and shook hands with busboy Juan Ramiro, just as Ceron Ceron stepped down from a low tray stacker beside the ice machine. 
rush past Euchre and reportedly fired an 8-shot 22 long rifle caliber Ivor Johnson Cadet 55A revolver. Kennedy fell to the floor and bodyguard William Berry hit Saran twice in the face, while others, including writer George Plimpton and Greer, forced him against the steam table and disarmed him. As he continued firing his gun in random directions, five other people were wounded, including William Weasel of ABC News, Paul Schrade of the UAAW Union, Democratic Party activist Elizabeth Evans, Ira Goldstein of the Continental News Service, and campaign volunteer Erwin Stroll. After a minute, Saron wrestled free and grabbed the revolver again, but he had already fired all the bullets and was subdued. Barry went to Kennedy and placed his jacket on the candidate's head, later recalling, quote, I knew immediately it was a 22, a small caliber, so I hoped it wouldn't be so bad, but then I saw the hole in the senator's head, and I knew. Reporters and photographers rushed into the area from both directions, contributing to the confusion and chaos. Kennedy lay wounded. Juan Romero cradled his head and placed a rosary in his hand. Kennedy asked Romero, Is everybody okay? And Romero responded, Yes, everybody's okay. Kennedy then turned away and said, Everything's going to be okay. This moment was actually captured by a live photographer Bill Epperidge and Boris Yar Yarrow of the Los Angeles Times and became the iconic image of the assassination. There was some initial confusion concerning who was shot, one witness believing that the primary victim was Kennedy's campaign manager and brother-in-law Stephen Edward Smith. Another witness stated that a female in a polka dot dress had exclaimed repeatedly, we killed him, before running away. Video footage of the witness's testimony can be seen in the Netflix series Bobby Kennedy for President. Kennedy's wife, Ethel, was three months pregnant. She stood outside the crush of people at the scene seeking help. She was soon led to her husband and knelt beside him. He turned his head and seemed to recognize her. Smith promptly appeared on television and calmly asked for a doctor. Friend and journalist Pete Hamill recalled that Kennedy had a, quote, kind of sweet, accepting smile on his face as if he knew it would all end this way. After several minutes, medical attendants arrived and lifted Kennedy onto a stretcher, prompting him to whisper, don't lift me, which were, last, which were his last words. He lost consciousness shortly after. He was taken a mile away to Central Receiving Hospital, where he received near death, or where he arrived near death. One doctor slapped his face, calling Bob Bob, while another doctor manually massaged his heart. After obtaining a good heartbeat, doctors handed a stethoscope to Ethel so that she could hear his heart beating. After about 30 minutes, Kennedy was transferred several blocks to the hospital of Good Samaritan. To undergo surgery, a gymnasium near the hospital was set up as temporary headquarters for the press and news media to receive updates on his condition. Surgery began at 3.12 a.m. and lasted 3 hours and 40 minutes. At 5.30 p.m. on Wednesday, spokesman Frank M. announced that Kennedy's doctors were concerned over his continuing failure to show improvement. His condition remained, quote, extremely critical as to life. Kennedy had been shot three times. One bullet was fired at a range of perhaps one inch and entered behind his right ear, dispersing fragments throughout his brain. The other two entered at the rear of his right armpit. One exited from his chest and the other lodged in the back of his neck. Despite extensive neurosurgery to remove the bullet and bone fragments from his brain, he was pronounced dead at 1.44 a.m. on June 6, nearly 26 hours after the shooting. Frank left the hospital and walked to the gymnasium, where the press and news media were set up for continuous updates on the situation. At 2 a.m. on June 6, Frank M. approached the podium, took a few minutes to compose himself, and made the announcement. I have a short announcement to read, which I'll read at this time. Senator Robert Francis Kennedy, who died at 1.44 a.m. June 6, 1968, was Senator Kennedy at the time of his death, where his wife Ethel, sisters Mrs. Stephen Smith, Mrs. Patricia Lawford, his brother-in-law, Mr. Stephen Smith, and his sister-in-law, Mrs. John F. Kennedy. He was 42 years old. Thank you. And before we continue, we'd like to thank our other sponsor, Audible. Audible is a subscription service that allows you to buy audiobooks that you can listen to on your phone, uh, on your computer, on any device. 
Audible allows you to choose from a gigantic array of audiobooks narrated by amazing narrators that you can listen to from anywhere. Right now I'm listening to The Dead Zone by Stephen King, narrated by James Franco. It's the chilling story of a high school teacher who falls into a coma and wakes up with psychic abilities. In all seriousness, audiobooks are great for when you're alone and want to take a break from perhaps podcasts and YouTube videos. Um, you can get a three free, excuse me, free 30-day trial by going to audibletrial.com slash Larry21. And with that 30-day free trial, you also get a free audio audiobook which you can keep even if you cancel your Audible service. And now let's get back to the episode. Saran Saran is a Palestinian Arab with Jordanian citizenship, born in Jerusalem, who held strongly anti-Zionist beliefs. A diary was found during a search of his home, and he wrote on May 19th, quote, My determination to eliminate RFK is becoming more and more of an unshakable obsession. RFK must die. RFK must be killed. Robert F. Kennedy must be assassinated. Robert F. Kennedy must be assassinated before June 5th, 68. It has been suggested that the date of the assassination is significant because it was the first anniversary of the start of the Six-Day War between Israel and its Arab neighbors. When Sirhan was booked by police, they found a newspaper article in his pocket that discussed Kennedy's support for Israel. Sirhan testified at his trial that he began to hate Kennedy after learning of his support. In 1989, he told David Frost in prison, quote, My only connection with Robert Kennedy was his sole support of Israel and his deliberate attempt to send those 50 bombers to Israel. So they obviously do harm to the Palestinians. Some scholars view the assassination as one of the first major incidents of political violence in the U.S. stemming from the Arab-Israeli conflict in the Middle East. The interpretation that Saran was motivated by Middle Eastern politics has been criticized as oversimplification and it ignores its psychological problems. Saran's lawyers attempted to use a defense of diminished responsibility during the trial, which Saran himself tried to confess to the crime and changes pleaded guilty on several occasions. He testified that he had killed Kennedy with, quote, with 20 years of malice after a forethought. The judge did not accept his confession, and it was later, later withdrawn. Excuse me. Sirhan was convicted of the murder of Robert Kennedy on April 17, 1969, and was sentenced to death six days later. In 1972, the sentence was commuted to life in prison with the possibility of parole after the California Supreme Court invalidated all pending death sentences that were imposed prior to 1972. Due to its ruling in California v. Anderson since that time, Sirhan has been denied parole 15 times and is currently confined at the Richard J. Donovan Correctional Facility in southern San Diego County. His lawyers have claimed that he was framed and he claims to have no memory of his crime. And let's take a look, take a closer look at the gun that was involved. The Ivor Johnson 22 caliber revolver that Sirhan used to assassinate Robert Kennedy originated from Albert Leslie Hertz, a resident of Alhambra, just south of Pasadena, California. He originally bought the gun to protect his own business during the Watts riots, but never used it and kept it in its original wrapping paper and box. Hertz's wife decided that the gun was too dangerous and gave it to her daughter, Diana Westlake. Uh, Westlake did not use it and gave the gun to her next-door neighbor, George Erhard. Erhard later sold the gun to Saran Saran's brother, better known as Joe, who George knew was working at Nash's department store at the corner of Arroyo and Colorado in Pasadena. At the time, Erhard was looking to seek more money from the gun sale to finance some work on his car. In an interview with the LAPD, uh, Saran's brother said that his brother asked him to obtain a gun because he wanted to visit a rifle range. He explained to them that rifle ranges rented guns to which Sirhan replied, quote, I don't want to get involved, I don't want a signature. Sirhan later asked if he knew any gun owners. His brother told investigators that, quote, I don't know why my brother wanted it. You know what? 
you know, <clears throat> wanted anything to do with guns. This request was because Saran was a non-citizen. It was illegal under California law for an alien to purchase firearms. Uh, Saran, the brother, later approached Erhard in the parking lot of Nash's store, and Erhard showed him the pistol. At this point, he said that he asked Erhard to bring the gun to Saran's house since his brother was interested in buying it. He stated that Ian Erhard went to Saran's Saran home and met him at the dining room where the three agreed to a sale price. He produced $19 and Saran paid the $6 balance. However, the LAPD summary report stated that on June 25th, 1968, a polygraph examination was administered to Saran's brother to determine his truthfulness regarding the gun and whether or not Erhard had ever been in the Saran home. Manir Saran responses to the question indicating he was being untruthful. He admitted that he was lying when he said Erhard had been inside his home. He corrected himself stated he had asked Erhard if he had any guns for sale, and that eventually Erhard showed him the 22 caliber revolver. He examined the gun in the parking lot of Nash's department store, and he told Erhard he did not have sufficient money to purchase the gun at the time. He asked Erhard to bring the gun to the corner of El Molino and Howard Streets in Pasadena late that evening, and told him that he would have the money to purchase a gun. He stated that he and Suron were together when Erhard came to deliver the gun. Munir Sirhan then stated that Sirhan Sirhan had been the one who bought the gun. Munir was again informed that the polygraph test showed that he had actually purchased the gun. He refused to change his story. It is likely that Munir and Sirhan purchased the gun in such a clandestine manner because they were both aware that it was unlawful for aliens to own handguns. Sirhan first shot the gun in March 1968 and practiced with it about a half a dozen times between March and May 1968. He said he liked guns. Sir, uh, according to his brother, Sirhan kept the gun in the glove compartment of his DeSoto. His brother often heard Sirhan playing with something that made a click click sound and he believed it was the gun. He had been frightened by the look in Sirhan's eye when his brother handed him the gun. In fact, he was so worried that he made Saran swear on their dead sister Ida that he would not use a gun in a bad way. Saran had violated three California laws merely by possessing the pistol he used to kill Robert Kennedy. Thus, if Saran were simply an unwitting patsy involved in conspiracy, they must have knowingly chosen a man who had been risking the whole conspiratorial venture by possessing an illegal weapon and firing it at a police range. Had Saran been caught with the illegal weapon? the conspiracy would have collapsed. At the time of the shooting, NBC and ABC News were signing off from their electoral broadcast. While the CBS coverage had already concluded, CBS's coverage began 21 minutes after the shooting. With Joseph Venti then preparing his anchoring duties for the CBS Morning News in the election studio at the CBS Broadcast Center in New York. Walter Cronkite joined him a half an hour later. Mike Wallace had co-anchored the primary election cover with Cronkite and Benty, and he appeared briefly after the shooting. Uh, CBS reporters Terry Drinkwater and David Schumacher delivered on-camera updates and interviews from the ambassador. Colleagues Roger Mudd and John Hart phoned in reports to New York. Later, Mudd presented on-camera updates on Kennedy's condition from Good Samaritan Hospital. At ABC, Howard K. Smith signed off, and the closing billboard aired, followed by a wide studio shot of Smith. Co-anchor Bill Lawrence and staff with the graphic raced to the White House California primary on, on screen. When the theme was completed after a moment of silence and a police stand by announcement, a portion of the theme was played again. Announcer Carl Caruso then alerted viewers to please stand by for a special report, with the wide shot and graphics still on the air as the theme played a third time. During that long static shot, the camera captured the panic and bewilderment in the New York studio. Two and a half minutes more passed before Smith returned to the air to say, Ladies and gentlemen, we have kept the, kept the air on because we have an alarm, alarming report that Robert Kennedy was shot in the ballroom at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. 
Smith would let clarify that word was received about the sound of a gunfire a short time earlier, but they waited to receive additional confirmation about what happened before making any announcements. Meanwhile, the ABC reporters at the ambassador crowded into the kitchen where Kennedy had been shot in the immediate ap aftermath was captured only by audio recording and cameras that had no live transmission capability. ABC was able to show scant live footage from the kitchen after Kennedy had been transported, but all of ABC's coverage from the ambassador was in black and white. One of the ABC reporters and the ambassador was Bob Clark, who had also reported from Dallas on the assassination of President Kennedy. Clark and Marlene Sanders later reported from Good Samaritan Hospital. At 7 a.m., Frank Reynolds joined Smith at the New York Anchor Desk with additional contributions by Roger Grim Grimsby, newly transferred to ABC's flagship station, WABC-TV. Sam Donaldson contributed reports from the ABC Bureau in Washington. As with the 1963 assassination of his brother, President John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy's death has been the subject of widespread analysis. Some individuals involved in the original investigation and some researchers have suggested alternative scenarios for the crime or have argued that there are serious problems with the official case. For one, there's the CIA involvement hypothesis. In 2006, the BBC's Newsnight program presented research by filmmaker Shane O'Sullivan alleging that several CIA officers were present on the night of the assassination. Three men who appear in films and photographs from the night of the assassination were positively identified by former colleagues and associates as former senior CIA officers who had worked together in 1963 at the CIA's main anti-Castro station based in Miami. They were J.M. Wave Chief of Operation David Morales, Chief of Maritime Operations Gordon Campbell, Chief of Ecological Warfare Operations George Junides. However, several people who had known Morales, including family members, were adamant that he was not the man who O'Sullivan said was Morales. After O'Sullivan published his book, assassination researchers Jefferson Morley and David Talbot also discovered that Campbell had died of a heart attack in 1962, six years prior to the assassination of Kennedy. In response, O'Sullivan stated that the man on the video may have used Campbell's name as an alias. He then took his identifications to the LAPD. This file shows the men he identified as Campbell and Joe Needs to be Michael Roman and Frank Owens, two Bulova sales managers attending the company's convention in the ambassador. O'Sullivan stood by his allegations, stating that the watch company was a well-known CIA cover. And then you also have the second gunman hypothesis. The location of Kennedy's wound suggested that his assailant had stood behind him, while some witnesses assert that Surratt faced west as Kennedy moved through the pantry facing east. This led to the suggestion that a second gunman actually fired the fatal shot. The possibility supported by the chief medical examiner and coroner for the county of Los Angeles, Thomas Noguchi, who stated that the fatal shot was behind Kennedy's right ear and had been fired at a distance of approximately one inch. Other witnesses, though, said that Kennedy was turning to his left, shaking hands as Surron approached facing north, so exposing his right side. During a re-examination of the case, in 1975, the Supreme Court ordered an ex expert examination of the possibility of a second gun having been used, and the conclusion of the experts was that there was little or no evidence to support this hypothesis. On February 22, 2012, Saran's lawyers, William Francis Pepper and Larry Dusick, or Lori Dusick, filed a court brief in the U.S. District Court in L.A., claiming that a second gunman fired the shots that killed Kennedy. It was the fourth and final in a series of federal briefs filed on the writ of habeas corpus. Judge Beverly Reed O'Connell denied the petition in 2015. And that is all we have for this episode of the True Crime Never Sleeps podcast. Let us know your thoughts on this topic. Uh, do you believe that Sirhan Sirhan truly killed Robert Kennedy? Let us know in the comments section below. And if you want to support the show, you can buy us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash TCNS. Your support will help the show grow, bring in more hosts, bring in more guests, uh, 
upgrade our equipment, find a studio that we can actually record in, not have to record in my tiny bedroom. But thanks for watching. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, and we'll see you next time.